Welcome to the Masters in Motion podcast, where we empower Masters athletes to reach their full potential. Join us as we delve into the world of CrossFit and showcase the strength, resilience, and determination of Masters athletes, because we love this sport. I'm Jason Grubb with Rick Stevenson, and we've got a special episode for you today. We had the opportunity to interview Adrian Bosman, so let's jump right into the interview. Adrian Bosman, aka Boz, requires no introduction, honestly, but in case you don't know, he began as an athlete in 2005 and quickly rose through the ranks to become a coach, seminar staff member, head judge at the CrossFit Games, and ultimately the director of the CrossFit Games. He's played a significant role, to say the least, in the growth of CrossFit over the years. And most importantly, he's a master's athlete himself. We're grateful to have you join us on the podcast, Boz. Thanks for having me, guys. I appreciate it. That's quite the intro. I just, for posterity's sake, I got to amend the first little bit and claim what I got. I found some recent journals like old school paper and pen workout logs where i actually have some crossfit workouts from 2004 the, just that yeah. last little bit of old school juice that i gotta squeeze out of that but i appreciate that yeah <laughs> and for for the listeners i'm i turned 40 this year so i'm, I'm aging up 40 to 44 year old division watch out next year you might know the the workouts ahead of time so there yeah. might be some slight advantage there but yeah look uh, out unfortunately, guys unfortunately i don't think uh, it's helping me that much <laughs> you guys are also big <laughs> boz you've been around forever as head judge for many years and no stranger to hype pressure. But now you're in the spotlight. As director of the games for the past year, what's that been like versus what you did before? It's a little bit weird. Yeah, my my official, the joke all the time is my official title is competition director, not exactly director of the CrossFit Games. It's the old assistant to the regional manager. But it is definitely different being in the spotlight to this degree, especially given the Dave Castro era. He certainly had a persona that everybody loved to hate. And I, like I, I think I approach things in a little bit different way than Dave, obviously. So I think a lot of people are expecting or were expecting like a carbon copy of that, where I'm going to say play the same public persona. And that's just not the case. So it is weird to see the way people interact with this paper version of yourself on the internet. And the internet is not exactly the, the, uh, the place for a lot of honest discourse, unfortunately. It might not be the friendliest place. It's, I, not no. even beyond that. It's, I think it's distorted in both ways. You get people that they're so effusive in their praise and that sort of thing, which is great, but. It's not particularly constructive and maybe not as well examined. And then on the other end of that, you get people that are just of no constructive intent and they just want to hate. And so you'd have to find the middle somewhere. But yeah, it's definitely weird being in the spotlight in that, to that degree. I would like to ask you a little bit of question about yeah. the, frost, the process. And I know in the past, we've seen the videos of Dave's compound that he had there, California, yeah. the, that room, the whiteboards, the uh, pads of paper post-it notes, things like that. Can you walk us through maybe your programming process, how it starts? I'm assuming you begin thinking about the next year shortly thereafter when you're done in Madison and what you'd like to improve upon. Or since you have, you and your team have the full year weaving open quarters, semis, and the games together, what's that process like? Well, that's a good question. <clears throat> to start, yeah, the... Planning process definitely starts pretty much once the previous year is wrapped up. And even before that, after every stage of competition, we have a lot of feedback that comes in and then we have a lot of things internally that we're like, Hey, that worked out great or didn't work out as we plan. Here's how we can make that better. And every year it's really just a, an assessment and trying to inch things forward. I think what's kind of unsatisfying about that process is that you have to wait the whole cycle to see if it works. Yeah. So for example, you do the open, you're like, okay, that was great in this regard and not so great in this regard. How do we improve it? We come up with a plan and then we don't get to do that for another 12 months almost. So that's the hard part in it. And at the end of the games last year, definitely had a lot that I was really happy about. And there's some things that I thought we could have tightened up. And I'll tell you, as far as like the programming idea, Jim, that came really thick after the game. So we all took some downtime, but in that downtime, I had a ton of ideas that were coming through. So really the goal was to just to try to capture them and keep them on ice for a little bit until I was ready to develop them a little bit more. So as far as the games, that that's how that kind of started. But I start like anybody else does when they're programming. I start at the whiteboard, map out a couple of big concepts that I think we need to hit. And then I start putting some ideas that are more refined to those concepts. For example, this year's open, it was pretty obvious to me that we needed a repeat. We didn't have one before, or at least not in 2022. We didn't have something that was heavy significantly. So that was an easy one. Open's always a good opportunity to start thinking about movements in a different way than maybe they've been seen in the past without getting too funky. And so those were the big spreads there. And so 
that was like, all right, here's a place to jump from. Because I think so many other kind of creative endeavors, if you've got that blank page just staring you in the face, it can be really hard to get started. So cracking the ice with a couple of big picture concepts can start to allow you to attach more concrete ideas to them. And then those can be developed further. So that, that's my process. Playing off of that, given the changes that we've had over the last few years, and Q didn't have responsibility for programming the, the old regional format. So now you and your team excited that you have that maybe story to tell all the way through that we won't know what that story is until you see it at the end of the games. You only had the two workouts that you programmed at the, uh, the at that point last year, but now you've got the full palette or wide open. Is there a theme that you, because it's your year to control really? That's a good question. I think about this a lot and I think of not only the competitors, but the fans of CrossFit as a sport and being competitive. And it's a lot, it's a lot to stay abreast of. It's hard to be a fan without having a pretty good working knowledge of what things are happening in front of you. And for that reason, I think it is fun to see a through line from the open all the way through the games, but I don't want to create a situation where there's so much thematic continuity that you would have had to have read the original in order to pick up on the sequel. If like the Die Hard movie, you go and you watch Die Hard 2, you're like, I get it. It's an awesome movie standalone. If I go back and watch the first one, it's even better, but I don't have to have that experience of the first cool. one to get the second one. And so that, that's how I feel about these different stages of competition. Yeah, they have to tie together, absolutely, but not so much in a way that it's so reliant on what came before it, that it falls okay. apart if you don't follow it all the way through. If, if, does that make sense? Yeah. Oh, that's absolutely. Absolutely. But I didn't ask, answer the, the first part of your question, which is uh, semis. And yeah, I am so pumped about semis this year. I got some fun stuff cooked up for, uh, for you guys with your online semi. Just talking about those today, it's going to be uh -huh. great. But the, the in-person semis for the individuals and teams, I'm very excited. And uh, I personally love the old regionals era where you got to armchair leaderboard and play the what if game. What if these different regions were competing all in one big super competition. And I think that creates such a cool buzz leading into the games that I'm really excited to see how that plays out. And this year, I, man, those big three semis in North America, West, East, and Europe yeah. is crazy. The rosters that are going to come out of that. If you're a fan of this at all, you're anywhere close to those, you are going to get a show and it's going to be so cool. I think you made reference to something like that. And maybe one of the other podcasts, how where I'm at now, we used to go down to Columbus for the Central East back in the day. Yep. And it was like a meat grinder. It was a mini games, both on the male and female side. If you were not able to make it out to Carson and you could get to Central oh, East, yeah. it was the show. Yep. It, that's what we imagine North America, West and Europe will be this year. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. I think it's going to be exactly that. For the people that can't get to Madison, it is going to be that mini games experience. And you're going to see the top dogs are just going at it. There's going to be all sorts of cool on-site experiences. They're bigger. So you're going to get your fill if you're able to make it to those semis. It's Excellent. Yes. Yeah. Since we're on that topic of programming, I remember at the games maybe two years ago, maybe three or four years ago, Dave would come and say hi and say hello as we were getting our welcome to the games. But we did discover along the way that one of the... Maybe the head judges there, I can't remember, but one of the people there was actually doing the programming for Masters at that time. <laughs> so I was curious, as you've taken on this role, do you do all of the workouts for Masters, quarterfinals, semifinals, and the games? Are you in charge of that as well? Are you the guy that we can say, it was you? Like, we could blame you. Like, we loved that workout, or you almost killed us, you know? Who we point the finger at? In the uh, the short answer, yes, I'm the guy. I'm And the way that I see the role is, like, I'm very much responsible for being the curator. My job to yes. pull all the elements together, and then ultimately say yes or no, as far as what we end up doing on the field. But it's my team's job to filter that through a bunch of different considerations. Okay, what does this look like from a scoring and timing perspective? What does this look like from a judging perspective? What does it look like from a, just a straight up broadcast? Does it, is it something that people can follow? And so we do take that and kind of mold it afterwards, but at the end of the day, yes, it's me. And to go back to the start of this question, in fairness to Dave, he filtered the age group workouts through his final stamp, even if there were other people that were responsible mm -hmm. for the initial yep. drafts of those. He, it's not fair to say that he wasn't like involved in that. He very much was, okay. but somebody yep. else generated it and then would filter it through him for the final approval. This year, meeting 2022, 
I did programming at the games for the age groupers, the teams, and the individuals. And then by extension of that, the adaptive athletes that were there. And I think it's important, at least for my process, to at least lay the groundwork for all of those because anybody who is starting the age group workouts, for example, they're not going to be privy to some of the more specialized equipment that we might have planned for the teams and individuals. My opinion, I love the idea of integrating that into all divisions when, whenever we can, because I do firmly believe that if you're qualifying to the games and you make it there, like you've earned that opportunity and you should get something that is a little bit unique. You should get something that you can't experience anywhere else. And so for that reason, it's that kind of cross-pollination of equipment and unique elements. It's very important to me. That's preserved. I think Rick and I would both give you feedback that we loved it. Yep. <laughs> Is that correct, yeah. Rick? You don't have to say that just because I'm sitting here. <laughs> Pushing the alpaca sled, which was miserable. And yeah, the bags we had to carry and even jumping over that log on our mini sprint in that one workout. Really, really fun to have those implements there. We've already heard chatter and debate about some of the new movements that were introduced. Introduced the open shuttle runs, burpee pull-ups. At quarterfinals so far, B-ups, crossovers, wall-facing handstand push-ups. Can you take us behind the scenes? What were your thoughts about introducing these movements this year? It, it, you mentioned an office, a quote from the office being assistant to the regional manager. <laughs> I'm thinking about when Michael was firing Toby and their exit interview in Michael's struggling. Who do you think you are? Or do, what do you think? No, but really, we'd love to with your thought process introducing these. We obviously don't know if they'll be for us as well yet. But we're all practicing all of them. Yeah. And I think that's, I hate to say it, but it's kind of mission accomplished. Like part of my belief is that CrossFit, the sport should not be codified insofar as there will always be things that you will be less prepared for because you didn't see them coming or you didn't train them in that specific way. And I think that's an integral part of what we do and who we are. And so at the point that competitive CrossFit just becomes a pool of 15 movements that everybody knows, and they train specifically for those just in different combinations. I'm like, we're done. We've done something fundamentally different than what we've set out to do. And so if you see a movement that comes up and you're like, whoa, I haven't been considering this. And now I'm out there practicing it and going town on it. I'm like, great. Whether it shows up in competition or not, in my opinion, is secondary to the benefit that you probably gain from including in your training. And I had a, actually a lot of people reach out to me last year and the beginning of this year after seeing the, the deficit chest to wall handstand pushups that the, the individuals did. And they said, you know what? We've started practicing those in the gym. My handstand walking has gotten better. My overhead strength has gotten better. My position is more confident. And it's because I started incorporating these into my training. You're like, great. Whether or not they show up in competition again is that's secondary. What is important is that you take a look at the training benefit and you say, okay, I'm good enough at doing kipping handstand pushups the way I've always done them. How can I make this harder and how can I expand my skill set a little bit further? Yeah. And so that trickle down, I think is really cool to see. As far as including those specific movements this year, I think that again, the chest wall is a single set for the individuals. They're ready for that. I think it's easier to judge, even though it's new. The position at the top is much more consistent than what many people can do when they have their back to the wall. So the lockout position is way easier from a standardization point of view. So that's nice. The crossover, I think is one of those fun type of things where I haven't heard a good argument yet from people that hate it as to why that is any less legitimate than a double under. Why is a double under okay, but a crossover is not other than it's just been grandfathered in. And that's the way that people have, have done it. I can't get anybody to present like a logical argument as to why one, but not the other. And in my opinion, the rope really is the tool that we have in our arsenal as CrossFitters for finesse to work on coordination, to work on agility, to work on stringing different patterns together in a way that's not load dependent. And it's a shame that tool has just been reduced to a double under machine, in my opinion. Now, that being said, I think people read into that and they say, okay, it's going to be just total buddy Lee routine in the span of a couple of years. And I'm like, no, I'm not interested in that either. But there are some basic fundamental things that everybody should be able to do with the jump rope. It's not rocket surgery. And I feel the same way about the V-up. The V-up is one of those movements that's deceptively difficult, stems from gymnastics. Greg used to talk about it all the time that gymnasts have core strength that is unrivaled and we should be yep. paying attention to what those mm -hmm. guys do to train their core. And that's one of them. So yeah. not having a gymnast background, that's what Jason and I talked about during lockdown, during COVID, the V-up was, oh, yeah. was just a substitute that you used. And so I believe a lot of us were introduced to it just not having a GHD machine, not having maybe an ab match, yeah. the ab match setup, so just varying your sure. setup positions. We'll see how it turns out. <laughs> yes. I like that. I did not listen to the press conference uh, last week. 
that you had, but we picked up parts of it where I believe, and maybe this is what the question, where the question comes from, how this stage and semifinals for both individuals and teams and age groups are that filtering process. Because I think the maybe the chatter, as Jason called it, about some of the new movements or the loading was a lot for, say, test three, that people were complaining. But if you don't up the, the standards at these next stages, you, you don't get the filter, the types of athletes that you're trying to pull through the process. Is that really the what we can expect as a community, each of these next couple of stages? Yeah, for sure. I think once you get past the open, we'll back up and say the open, yes, you want people to participate. You want people to be able to feel like they can play, they can take a shot. And then there's going to be some times where, yeah, they're confronted by the test and they can't make it past a certain stage. I had a six minute all out barn burner for 23.3 and I was in good company with a lot of other people. Right. And that's, hey, fair play. That's, that tells me pretty definitively where I need to work in that context. Once you get out of the open, the quarterfinals, you're still in a tricky position just because of the range of athletes that are still competing. Yep, the pure number. And yeah, exactly. And so you need to make sure that you have a heavy element that filters through to your point. But it's not unapproachable that people just don't want to play. And I feel we achieved that pretty well. You referenced test number three. And yeah, there were some people that they didn't make a rep or they only got one or two. That's okay. I think the vast majority did. And there were plenty of people that took a crack at it. They didn't know if they could do it and they PR'd. And that's part of it too. It's that extended open magic. Yeah. And I think the further away you get from the open, the more that gating process can be more aggressive. Yeah, obviously you have to temper it. It can't be so aggressive right at the quarterfinals that right. you're discouraging people from signing up and doing it because ultimately that's the goal. If we want people to participate. We want people supporting the sport in that way, but it does have to present enough that the best are also going to be challenged. Age group quarterfinals is coming next week. We yep. get floor plans on Monday to be exciting. We got the email yeah, this week and we saw five tests over two days, which is a little bit of a change from last year, a shorter time yes. to accommodate schedules for busy, busy mm -hmm. master's athletes, which is fair to say. How do you see, or what are your thoughts? How do you see the five tests playing out in the shorter time frame? Honestly, the quarterfinals is some of my favorite time of the year for that reason. It's like people get these little hints, they have a little bit more information than they did during the open. And so like you can run wild with the speculation, which I think is great. But yeah, I think the big pieces of feedback that led us to, hey, a two-day competition is probably going to be more palatable for more master's athletes in particular. Yeah. And shifting that over the course of the weekend so that we're not concerned about taking time off work or trying to shuffle other yeah. things around as much. Mm -hmm. That being said, like we're not going to try to just take that same length and smash it into two days. So like we are definitely considering what's viable inside that 24 hour window. And it's not right. just going to be, okay, it was a three day competition. Now it's the same demands For, inside right. a two day competition. Okay. That's, yeah, Fair enough. that's not the game. We have some listener questions. We posted out to okay. social media. Cool. We got a lot of really good questions. We tried to filter and combine them down into four, I think fairly simple, direct questions. Rick, you want to take sure. the first one? Yeah, be glad to. One listener question was, are there any plans for having in-person semifinals for masters. Yes. <clears throat> now that yes comes with a very strong a caveat. caveat. Yes. Is we have to be, <clears throat> yeah, we have to be in a place where we're comfortable that we can do it right. Mm -hmm. But we talk about this every year. We're like, man, it would be really cool if we could offer that. When that happens, I don't know how that looks. I'm not sure. Because the obvious challenge with that for the age group divisions is that you guys are competing globally yeah. within a certain age bracket, not regionally based on others in your area. And so that becomes very difficult. And the issue of fairness comes into play when you're thinking about the season. Say, okay, let's say we go to a age group or in-person semi and it's in May and it's hosted in City X. Well, somebody who's around the world from that has to fly to that location, right. compete, potentially qualify, fly back home and then fly again to Madison in very short time frame. It's questions like that are logistic in nature and speak to the fairness for all competitors that are the hardest hurdles to jump. Now, I think everybody would agree that in-person is just a better competition experience. Very few people say, you know what? I just love this online thing. I like doing it in the vacuum. I just lock me in my garage and let nope. them nuts. Nope. Nobody <laughs> no, says no. that, but, and we agree, yeah. like it's nice to have that in-person experience. So when we are able to pull that off with 
confidence that we can do it in a way that's fair for everybody and represents what it should be, then we'd like to move in that direction. But I don't know when that's going to be. I can't make any promises sure. for a 24 season, et cetera. That's fair. Thank you. I'm going to ask you an, another listener question that is probably it's along the same lines and your answer will likely be similar in the sense that you can't make promises, but I think I know your intentions. So there were over 154,000 Masters athletes, RX, in the Open this year. And I just looked at the RX numbers. That's more than individuals and teens combined. Mm. It's this huge group. Yep. I thought that was fascinating. And that's not to create a context for this question. I just thought it was interesting. So the actual question yeah. is, we've had 10 in the, at the games. We've had 20 at the games. You get this question every year. And I think all of us are hoping that the more the merrier in the future. Do you still see that as possible or realistic? I do. And again, it's the same answer. Yeah. We want to be able to do that in a way that we can do it right. And we can create the experience that the game should be. When you start doing the math on nine men's divisions and nine women's divisions, mm -hmm. time disappears on you very quickly. And so you're faced with the dilemma of, okay, do we run a competition and every test is like seven minutes or less? And we just rinse and repeat that? Or do we accept the fact that with a smaller field, we can really truly create the range of tests that's necessary to determine the fittest in each particular group. So there's a bit of natural tension. And part of that has to do with the time that we're able to be on site. Part of that has to do with the facilities we have to work with. And that all to say that those are considerations when we start looking for season 25 and beyond and a new venue to the game. So that's right. a big consideration is, all right, how do we work towards including more people at that stage and have the logistical capacity to pull it off in the way that it reflects what it should be? So yes, it, again, that's the same general answer is we're always looking at ways to try to get back to that. We're not going to pull the trigger on it until we're really confident that we can do it to the standard that we'd hope. And I appreciate the answer in the context that you're able to provide around that, that it's not a dis, it's not that you're, and we're not overlooked. It is tremendously lo logistically based. And I get that. It's a ton of age groups and a, yep. a ton of people. And when we have had 20 per group. I mean, just thinking about the warm-up area and how large that is in the years that we've had that. Sure. It's, it's a tremendous amount of people. Rick, you got another question sure. for us? Sure. Wanted to get your thoughts on your approach or the team's approach to programming for 55 and up for the age groups versus the 35 to 54 category. How do you look at that for each of the stages, perhaps, with movement standards, weight discounts, things like that? The framing of that's funny, the weight discount. I like that. <laughs> that's good. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, a lot of it's historically informed. At this point, we've been including age groups for a number of years now at a lot of different stages. And so we do have a pretty good sense of where they net out. Now that's, that said, we're not perfect by any stretch. And I think the evolution of the sport is also tricky to pin down because not only do you have athletes that are now competitive throughout a decade plus right. of CrossFit experience, they're coming into those age groups where historically one way it might've been appropriate, but it's no longer the case because everything's risen so, so greatly. So it's definitely a moving target. It's a little hard to pin down, but yeah, that's the basis of it. We take a look historically at what's been done. What was the result of that? Did it get close to what we thought the original intent of the test should have been? And then we go from there. And there's a lot of healthy debate about that on our team when it comes time to create some of these variations. It's, it's not at all a set saying that is unexamined. Okay. We uh, definitely spend a lot of time arguing those. So you will go back and look at past results from Absolutely. each of the stages. Yep. Maybe it's 55 and up from the games yes. or 55 and up for some online semis and or a, the old AGOQ and look yep, at, definitely. okay, here was our loading for the younger masters. What is appropriate given what were the stimulus maybe that we're trying to achieve for that test? That's what the appropriate loading should be for yeah, you got it. And same kind of thing. I guess the harder guessing game, I shouldn't say guessing game, but the harder target to me is knowing when it's appropriate to add harder variation movements to some of the older divisions in particular. Last year, we really stretched some of the older divisions with some of the challenges that they faced. Legless rope climbs, for mm -hmm. example, muscle ups, things like that, that traditionally hadn't been a part of those divisions right. competition. And in some ways, in some instances, I'm like, yep, that was totally appropriate. I think adding the bar muscle ups to the age group semis last year was a win. I think the legless rope climb 
for the most part, was also a win. That's right. The muscle-ups at the games for the, the older women's divisions in particular, I think was a bit of a miss. So we're always coming back and looking at those and saying, okay. all right, were there enough people that could get through the gate in a way that was appropriate or did this stop the field? And then let's take the next step from there. Gotcha. Thank you. Yeah. Foz, one of the questions, this is the last listener question. And then Rick will have a uh, just for fun question. It's a doozy. It's a uh, buckle up. It's a fun one. Okay, um, great. But oh, I like fun. For Masters athletes, over the past couple of years, we've experienced some inconsistencies in the number of qualifiers, the number of days for qualifiers, the number of athletes at the games, which again, that was the previous administration. It's a sport that's constantly evolving. The question with that in mind is in, in the Adrian Bosman world of the cross of the future of CrossFit, what's in store for Masters under your watch? Oh man, that's a broad question. <laughs> uh, it's a very broad question. It's, this is your opportunity. <laughs> To pitch to masters, to, to people that you're age, like, hey, guys, we've got, this is what we have in store for you. Again, a broad yeah. stroke, but what keeps guys that may have some frustration hopeful about this sport going into the future? Yeah, that's a, okay, let's frame it a couple of different ways. I think that if yeah. the age group categories are coming in with the expectation that they are going to have the same spotlight as, say, the Tia Claire Toomey's of the world. I think that's a mismatch in terms of expectation. However, on the other end of that, if the expectation is, hey, I can compete in this sport that will continue to challenge me regardless of where I am on that age group ladder, and it will continue to push the bounds of what people consider to be fit. And therefore the world at large can in turn start to pick up on that and say, this is what's possible as one ages and one does have an eye for keeping their head in the game. They can expect that for and it's really important to me that we continue to do our best to try to highlight what you guys are capable of for that reason. I think if we take a step back and we look at the games on, a, on the whole, and we think about what is the most important function of the CrossFit Games, in my opinion, and this might ruffle a few feathers for some people that are competitively minded, it's not so important that we give out a bunch of prize money and we highlight the winner of a division and put them on this pedestal. And that's cool. It's fun to do. But at the end of the day, what we should be creating is an inspirational aspirational outlet so that people can take a look and say, wow, I didn't even know that was possible. Look at what this person can do and look at the range of their abilities. By extension of that, look at the range of this person's abilities, despite the fact that they're a working professional, despite the fact that they've got a family, despite the fact that they have some city miles under their hood, so to speak. And that to me is the most high calling of the CrossFit Games, because as we all know, like the lifestyle of CrossFit has so many benefits in the world at large is not in tune with not that. Not even close. Yeah. Creating opportunities for age group athletes to really showcase that is really important to me. And I'm, I'm pretty dedicated to making sure that challenge exists for the age groupers. There's something there that's legitimate that they can sink their teeth into to continue to push the bounds of what we know to be true about aging. I'm thinking, so I don't know if that, thinking back to that, uh, maybe about three or four minute video clip that your media team put out after the games that really highlighted the master's community. And it was really yep. focusing on, if you looked at the number of athletes that just had a small clip in it, it was the upper age groups and yep. what was possible. And this is, and it was all, all across all of the athletes, men's and women, didn't matter if they had finished first or 10th. It was look at what they are do, able to do in this sport. And that's, that was fun to watch. Yeah. So, yeah I'm glad you guys enjoyed yeah. that. Yeah. But yeah, so I, I guess that's what I, where I am most dedicated is to say, hey, how can we showcase this? How can we, by extension, use it as a tool to get more people involved so that they yeah. can in turn reap the positive benefits of what we know to be true about CrossFit? I'm on board. I'm sold. I think that even thinking about the scope of CrossFit as a, yeah. as a way of drawing people in, like when they see gray hair and Rick and I have plenty of it and they see what's possible. And then we, when we walk into most boxes are full of more people with gray hair Absolutely. Um, than yeah. anyone else. And it, it's been fun being a master's athlete that has an opportunity to, to inspire people to get off the couch, to get out and to just try CrossFit, especially as someone yeah. who started at 38 with nothing. Yeah. And yeah, there you go. Um, yeah. I think that's, that resonates with so many people. And I think about this all the time where yeah, you get to a certain age and I'm not old by any stretch. I don't feel old. I, the number is not that great either. Like I'm, I'll be 40 this year. It's not crazy. But as I do reflect on things I did in my twenties and my thirties, not physical things, but just more so the outlet to be able to take on challenge that presents itself to you. I think it's true for most of us that if you're not actively pursuing that past a certain age, it doesn't happen. Once you get past kind of college age, 
if you're not actively putting yourself into these positions that challenge you physically, yep. et cetera, they're not going to just happen. And I think that in turn can lead to some people developing the mentality that like, you just don't challenge yourself past a certain age. And, yep. and I think that's real shame. It's unfortunate that people tacitly start to believe that. We use yeah, the excuse, we can do I'm old. Why, why should yeah, I? Yeah, exactly. If nobody else around me is yep. doing it, why should I do it? Yeah. And so the more that we can get the mentality, why should you do it? I'm old. It, that should be the reason. It's, should I do it? I'm old. <laughs> yes. Like it's more important for me to do that at that stage because those walls are only coming in. They're not oh, yeah. pushing out unless you yeah. really fight against it. You say that phrase Wait, all the time. Are you, Father time is undefeated. Yeah. So that's right. <laughs> that's correct. <laughs> all right. Question. The fun question here. We remember the Dave Castro is a prick. Sure. Okay. And stuff. <laughs> From yeah. Josh Bridges. We know it was done with Dave's permission. It was done in good fun. It goes back to when Dave was Josh, one of Josh's instructors in SEAL training. And I believe it raised money for a charity that I think Dave even chose. Everybody loved that shirt. And so the question for you is, have you given any thought to a shirt that would have your name on it and what it would say? And who would you like to start that process for you? Oh, it's a good question. It's funny. Through the years, there's been a couple. There was only Boz can judge me shirt. There's a small run of those that got made. I don't remember who made them or what the, the outcome was, but the, every once in a while, you'll see one of those float around. So that's fun. And then there was a small run of shirts that the Adrian Bosman is also a prick, which I thought was funny. Both of those came out after this year, but I, I haven't given it that much thought. I don't know. Good question. Come back to me on that one. I, gotta, I was going to say, gotta, let's let, a little let's bit. let a full season go under your belt. Start yeah. Start to finish. <laughs> We'll come back to you on that. And in fairness, is that really for me to say? It's kind of like choosing yeah. your nickname. Yeah. We get to do that. I feel like that should be uh, left to the public. Left to the person of your choice. I bet you James Hobart. Oh, okay. All right. Yeah. There's He's a creative guy. He's on the clock. More creative than most people yeah. think. Yeah. Yeah. James is on the clock. We just want to thank you so much for being on the show with us. We don't want to take up more of your time or too much of your time. It's a really busy season. So again, thanks for taking this time, middle of the season, to connect with us, to connect with Masters Athletes. Dude, we really appreciate you. Hey, my pleasure, man. Thank you guys for reaching out. Thanks for tuning in to this special episode of Masters in Motion. If you found this episode helpful, we'd be so grateful if you would take a moment to leave us a five-star rating on Apple Podcasts or your preferred podcast app. Your support helps us reach more listeners and grow our Masters community. Until next time, get bolder, not older. See ya.